Good morning. We are in a series called... All right, come on. Now, I don't normally ask for more than that, but can we say it together? Kingdom culture. We're looking at the kingdom and the culture that King Jesus came to earth to bring. The kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven is the place where the king's will is done. That's the easiest definition of the kingdom. It's the place where the king's will is done. And that will is done largely through us as kingdom citizens authorized by the king. We may be ordinary, everyday people, but we carry the authority of the Most High God. That's a big deal. My first job out of college, actually, at my whole adult life, I've worked two jobs within sight of this space. The first, for six years, I worked for Nielsen Construction right across, the, across 81. And I was an estimator for Nielsen estimating the cost of commercial construction projects like schools and hospitals and manufacturing plants and stuff. And one of the more nerve-wracking things I did early in my role was delivering bid proposals for jobs. So a coworker and I would gather the right documents for a bid. We would drive to an office like JMU we would get there early to the facilities department and we would sit in the car on our phones. Remember the phones with the antennas? Did we really need the antenna or was that just to make, remind us we were on a phone? I don't know. And we would sit there and we would wait until we got a call from the estimating department back at the home office, which was scrambling to prepare the bid because most contractors don't give you their number till the last minute. That's a whole other thing. And so a few minutes before the bid was due, our office would call us and give us a number. We'd write that number on the paperwork, and we would literally run it into the building to submit it. Some of these, and I mean, we would get the call like two minutes before. Some of these were 20 to $30 million projects we were signing our names for. Now, I didn't have the capacity to build a $30 million facility, but it didn't matter because I represented a corporation that did. I was, you could say, with Nielsen, and that was enough because they could get the job done. It wasn't my authority, it was the authority of the person that I represented that mattered. It was the will of Nielsen, you could say, that was done through me. You were created not only to represent the authority of another, not just to wear the t-shirt that says Christian, you were created to live with that authority. You were created to live with the authority and the power of Jesus Christ, the creator king of everything that exists. And that is what it means to live as a part of a kingdom culture. Let's pray. Jesus, I pray that you would help us to get this. We thank you for your written word. We thank you for your spirit. We thank you for your church, your body. You've given us all of these different things to help us to know you and to empower us to follow you. And God, I pray that you would quiet our minds right now from all the other things that try to distract us from hearing you. And I pray that you would speak your truth, that you would plant your truth in our hearts today like the seeds we're going to talk about. In Jesus' name, amen. So Jesus, Jesus gave us 12 parables or stories on the kingdom of God, and each one describes the kingdom culture or the kingdom life in a unique way. This morning, we're going to look at Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13 is the longest set of teaching on the kingdom of God. According to Matthew, Jesus is sitting in a boat just off the shore of Galilee, and all the people are, are, sitting, are standing there on the shore while he's talking to them. That not only gave, made for good acoustics, they would also like leave him alone for a little bit so he could actually teach them. 
And Jesus told, uh, told the people seven of his 12 parables on the kingdom from that setting. We're going to look at three of those that fit together like a nice little trilogy this morning. This is Matthew chapter 13. Jesus has just finished telling them the longest, one of the longest parables, the parable of the soils. And now he, he says this. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping... His enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat, and he went away. So Jesus is the farmer planting the seeds, the good seeds or the wheat. The devil is the enemy planting the weeds, and the field that they are both planting in is the world. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. Both eventually produced some kind of visible results. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, Do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you are pulling the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned. Then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. This is a picture of the final judgment we will all face when God will separate humanity based on what they believed and how they lived according to those beliefs. There is that judgment day coming to all of us. Jesus told them another parable, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds come and perch in its branches. He told them still another parable. This is the third parable for today. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into about 60 pounds of flour until it worked all through the dough. Jesus uses metaphors like weeds and wheat, but the kingdom of God is no metaphor. Kingdom living is not some abstraction. It's not just an idea. The kingdom life is a particular life. We see that in the the wheat and the seeds. The kingdom life is a planted life. We see that in the mustard seed. And the kingdom life is a positioned life life. We see that in the yeast. First of all, the kingdom life is a particular life. The kingdom life is not whatever we want it to be or wish it to be. The kingdom life is a particular life. There is a specificity to it. There's a particular kind of living expected of us as kingdom citizens who call Jesus Savior and Lord. Uh, Dwayne White, pastor and doctor now, Dwayne White at Vision Quest, our men's retreat recently, he said, we can only have the life of Christ when we live the lifestyle of Christ. Think about that. We can only have the life of Christ, the amazing life to the full life of Christ when we live the lifestyle of Christ. Friends of mine, have been in Spain this past week. They traveled as family to watch my one friend's father, Jack Tanzi, you can put that picture up, compete in the 2024 Tora Molinos Andalusia World Triathlon Championship Finals. This is a pre this is a pre-race ceremony. Jack is 75 years old. Jack has completed three Ironman triathlons. Ironmans, by the way, in case you didn't know, begin with a three-mile swim, followed by a 112-mile bike ride, and finished by a marathon, okay? Jack has done three of those. Now, the race Jack did yesterday was shorter. It was only an Olympic distance, but it was still a triathlon, and Jack is still 75. Now, Jack 
has the life of a globally ranked triathlete at 75 because he lives the life of a competitive global triathlete. triathlete. Now, I can think I'm a triathlete. I can believe I'm a triathlete. I can tell you I'm a triathlete. I can put on an outfit like Jack, and I can put it all over Instagram, but it is a joke if I'm not living the lifestyle of an athlete. Are you tracking with me? There is a particularity. I've discovered that word somewhere, and I'm using it all the time, whether it's relevant or not. There is a... <laughs> There is a particularity, a specific set of customs for a globally ranked triathlete that he has to live by. Just like there is a particularity, there is a specific set of customs for a kingdom citizen. Read the New Testament and you will get clear instructions how to live a kingdom life. The Apostle Paul told the Romans, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking. It's not the things we're all obsessed with. The kingdom of God is a matter of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God. Unlike secular humanism, which proposes that truth and goodness is whatever you define it to be. The scriptures define Jesus as the ultimate truth and goodness, and everything opposed to Jesus and opposed to his kingdom as counterfeits. Unlike pluralism or universalism that proposed that all paths might lead to paradise, Jesus makes it clear that he alone is the way to paradise. He is the way, the truth, the life. He's the only way to God the Father. Whoever believes and is baptized, Jesus said, will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. Jesus is very black and white and particular about some things, and we need to know what those are and live by them. At the close of our time together, we're going to give you a chance to become a citizen of the kingdom, to get your permanent residency, so to speak, if you haven't yet already done that. And we're going to give all of us a chance to recommit to that life if you're already living within it. The kingdom life is the best life you'll ever live, but there is a very particular life style that goes with it. Secondly, the kingdom life is a planted life. The wheat, the mustard seed, the yeast, they're really only valuable when they are planted, when they are buried. There is this genetic code that is written into the seeds, but it doesn't activate until it's buried, until they're buried. Their true identity isn't realized until they are planted, buried, surrendered to the soil or the dough, and we are the same. Very truly, I tell you, Jesus said in a different setting in the Gospel of John, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. At first, he's talking about his own, his own life. Jesus is that kernel that dies and produces many seeds. But then he says, anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. When he says anyone, he's now including all of us in that. And he's talking about everything that we are enamored with must take second place to him and his will. Only to the degree we surrender not only our lives in a big picture way, but our everyday rights to be right, only as we surrender our right to be self-sovereign, to be kings and queens of our own little kingdoms, to boss everybody around to tell them what to do to fit into our desire. Only as we surrender that do we become who Jesus created us to be. This week, this week I was talking with a young guy in my small group who told me how he found himself in a texting war with his brother. He gave me permission to share that. By the way, I was just thinking I would just spontaneously have you guys come up here and, no, I'm just kidding. 
That would be fun, though. Their little texting war would probably still be going on to this moment if one of them hadn't heard the Spirit's correction, stopped testing, and said to himself, or more like the Spirit said to him, you know, I don't, I don't need to be right here. I don't need to defend myself or explain myself. Love is the only thing that's going to resolve this thing. I'm done. And he put his phone down. And what do you know? The whole thing is beginning to resolve. By the way, just a little bit of pastoral encouragement. Use your phone, use your texting and your email to bless people. Don't send, don't send super challenging things over text or email. Call somebody, at least call them. Better yet, be in somebody's face when you have something really challenging, corrective, hard to say. Don't fight over text and email, okay? That's just a... We, how much better would this in every community be if we could do that? We talk a lot about the initial and the big picture surrender of our lives to Christ. That's the initial part of the Christian life. But I believe every time we surrender to doing things the king's way instead of our own way, we plant another patch of the kingdom in that space. Every time we surrender our natural power for God, we release a supernatural power in those moments because in those moments we're partnering with God. What is something you have been trying desperately to make happen in your life? Think about that for a second. Could be a relationship. You want to be loved by someone. A spouse, a child, a parent. And you are doing everything you know to make that thing happen. It could be a career aspiration. You want so desperately to be successful in something. That's, that's a good thing. Again, like the relationship, it's a good thing. It could be overcoming an addiction or getting out of debt or something. You want to be free from something. Again, that's a good thing. All of these are good things. All of these are great. But you will not find true love, success, or freedom on your own in any of these things as, as, good, as, as good as they are. The life we all want, the good things we all want are really only available through surrender. Author John Eldridge, who wrote the famous book Wild at Heart, calls it benevolent detachment. Benevolent detachment. And he says, you know, the prayer he offers us is this very simple prayer. Jesus, I give everyone and everything to you. Surrendering things or people to God is not quitting or giving up. Surrendering things or people to God is giving them up to God. They're very different. And it's trusting that he's going to do something in that situation when you surrender it. So that's the second one. The kingdom life is a particular life. The kingdom life is a planted life. And the third one, the kingdom life is a positioned life. The kingdom comes where particular lives are planted in strategic positions within the world. They're not planted just in the church. They're not planted just in your home. These are lives that need to be planted in and throughout the world, frankly, that isn't asking for them. Planted in a world that, frankly, doesn't want them there in a lot of cases. A world that will reject you for being planted there. But there, there is a purpose in where we are positioned. I know it's a lot of peas. Look at that one with the yeast again briefly. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into about 60 pounds of flour until it worked all the way through the dough. How many of you have ever baked bread? That's a lot of people, actually. How hard would it be to need to work yeast into 60 pounds of flour? I don't know, would that cover like your entire kitchen table? 
the kingdom of heaven is like yeast that must be worked all the way through the dough. Why? Because any part that doesn't have yeast can't rise to become the bread it was created to be. The kingdom of heaven must be brought into, pushed into every crack and corner of the world so that every space can be impacted by the kingdom. And we are somehow both the woman working the yeast into the dough and we are the yeast that must be spread into every particle of it. Our vision at Grace is to see people so full of Jesus, they transform every space they occupy, like wheat in a field, like a giant mustard tree in a garden, like yeast in, in dough. And that will be at least a part of our vision until Jesus returns because he's not coming back until that happens. There's all this question about when the end is going to come. And one thing we know for sure, Matthew 24, 14 says, the gospel of the kingdom will be preached into every people group, will be, the yeast will be spread into every people group, and only then will the end come. And here's how this matters for you. We are, you are, you are strategically positioned in this world for a reason, just like the yeast was mixed in the dough. God has, God has you planted where you are now. He has positioned you for a purpose. We reject that because it would be easier to be somewhere else a lot of the times. King Solomon wrote, the mind of a person plans their way, but the Lord makes firm their steps. Some of you are wishing you were somewhere else. Not only right now, but generally speaking, you're, you wish you were somewhere else, but God has you where you are for a purpose and you're not gonna be moved on to the next thing until you complete the assignment where he has you. The apostle Paul said it like this, preaching to the Athenians in Greece. He said, the God who made the world and everything in it, he himself gives everyone life and breath and all things like we sang this morning. From one man, he has made every nationality to live over the whole earth and has determined their appointed times and the boundaries of where they live. God has you living, working where you are now. He has you positioned right there for a purpose. And here it is, Paul continues. He did this so that they, the people groups, all the people of the earth, might seek God and perhaps might reach out and find him though he is not far from each one of us. You are not in your job just to make money and provide for your family. You are there because someone near you at your work is seeking God. And perhaps, as Paul says, perhaps they might reach out and find him through you. You're not at your school just to learn something. You're there because someone near you is seeking God. They don't even know it, but they're seeking God. And perhaps, as Paul says, they might reach out and find him through you. I want to do a quick little exercise. Pull out your phone. If you if you brought your phone, did anybody, I don't know. People bring their phones. Like we have our phones hip attached to our hips. Scroll through either some texts or phone calls or your calendar. Take your pick. And I don't. I don't I'm not offended if you get distracted at this point. Who has God positioned you next to for a purpose? You see those names, you see those appointments. They are not random. Who has God strategically positioned you next to for a purpose? Okay, now you can put your phone away unless you, unless you can multitask. Actually, it's fine, it's fine. I have a friend who works in higher education 
he's got a lot of responsibility as the assistant to someone with a mega amount of responsibility. I don't wanna go into the details. The person he works for is very difficult to work for and has been for quite some time. This person that has recently been, um, their position has not been renewed. And so this person, after all these years of being, it's been a difficult situation, now has um, an opportunity to speak truth into the, speak truth into this person in this higher authority in a way nobody else has. The way you live your everyday life around people is partly what earns you the right to speak into the lives of the people around you. God has my friend there for a very specific reason. And back to our vision, I believe this friend of mine is so full of Jesus that he and Jesus are together transforming the space of that office and therefore transforming the space of that campus. The impact, like the mustard seed, initially is invisible, but give it some time and it becomes a tree of life right there in the middle of an absolute mess. The kingdom life is a particular life. It's a planted life life and it's a life positioned for the very specific purpose of bringing the kingdom of God and the kingdom culture into the world around you make no mistake about it kingdom living is hard the things Jesus is expecting of us are difficult following Jesus obeying Jesus Living the Jesus way in a culture offended by God is hard. But ignoring Jesus, disobeying Jesus, rejecting his teaching, and living life your own way is even harder. So what are we to do? The same friend I was talking about says we need to, he says, choose your heart. Have you ever heard that? Choose your heart. Saving money is hard. Being broke is hard. Choose your heart. Staying married is hard. Divorce is hard. Choose your heart. Being disciplined in any way is hard. Being undisciplined brings all kinds of other difficulty. Choose your heart. Life with God is hard. Life without God is hard choose your heart the good news is God has promised to be with us and to help us every step of the way when we choose life with him through his written word through his spirit through the church that is this this body he lives within us he goes before us he speaks to us all day long to guide us into his living so I want to pray as we close this morning. I want to pray for, I don't want anybody to have to leave here this morning without a permanent kingdom residency. I first want to pray with anyone who has not yet surrendered their life to Christ, ever. You've never said, I'm willing to be planted in the soil and used for whatever God you would use me for. So if that's you, I want you to agree with this prayer. Pray along with me, and we can all pray this prayer together. Jesus, I believe in you. I believe that you gave your life up, that you died for my sin. 
I ask for your forgiveness. I ask for your help in living the life you created me to live. I want you to be my savior. I'm willing to follow you as my Lord. I commit my life to you. In Jesus' name, amen. That simple prayer is like the vows we give on the day we're married, which takes about that long to do. And then from there, we have the choice of how we live and recommit to those vows every single day going forward. So now I want to pray for the rest of us. And let's have us all stand if we would. And if you would, if you're in agreement, let's recommit ourselves to the Lord. Jesus, I thank you for giving your life for me. Because of you, I can have life to the full. And frankly, I'm not living that life to the full in a few areas. Jesus, would you help me to follow you more faithfully? God, would you help, would you help me to surrender my life absolutely and totally for you? God, would you bring to mind right now in this room specific areas in the lives of these people where there must be a surrender in order for them to live life to the full? Would you bring to mind right now for the people here good things they need to surrender that are getting in the way between them and you? And sin wrong living that's getting in the way between them and you. Only through you, Jesus, can we live the lives we were created for. Only through you can we find life to the full. And so I pray that you would help us as the people of Grace Covenant to discover that afresh and in a new way today. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so let's have the ministry team come forward who love to pray for anybody for any reason. If you have made some confession of faith, maybe for the first time, please come forward and let us pray with you. Or if really, if for any reason of any kind, if you would like prayer, don't leave here without coming forward and getting it. If you're new or you're newer and you're not yet connected around here, please stop by the, the corner back there and we'll get, you, we'll get you connected. Otherwise, we love you. God bless you all. Have an awesome day. We'll see you next time.